open your Bibles to Genesis 1, 28, chapter 1, verse 28. <clears throat> I apologize in advance. My throat will go, my voice will go in and out because I'm fighting allergies. So just bear with me. Genesis 1, 28. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. I want you to circle the word replenish. In this verse, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish. Now, the gap theory doctrine people use this verse. This, this is their champion verse that they use to launch their gap theory doctrine nonsense. Well, you're blunt about that. I usually am concerning the things of the Word of God, especially when people don't do their research and start interpreting scriptures that fits their narrative and accomplish the agenda they set out to accomplish, even if it twists the Word of God and takes it out of context, and I just won't <clears throat> sit back and say nothing about it when I finally get on a, a certain topic. In this case, it happens to be the gap theory doctrine. And this is the first place, I'll use chapter 9, 2, verse 1 also, but this is the first place they use it to launch their silly doctrine. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. Now I'm going to read you something. It's lengthy, but it puts into words what I research over the years. And it does it all within probably 30 minutes of reading, of, of reading that I think is the point across what I am trying to present to you this evening. <clears throat> now, before we move forward in God's timeline in this section of the Last Day series, I have to set the record straight on this particular verse so there's no confusion. The key word being replenish. When a modern reader sees the word replenish, he naturally thinks the, the world to be refilled with people by Adam and Eve. And of course, for the earth to be refilled, that means it must have been previously full at one point, and then emptied for some reason. That's our modern understanding of the word replenish. Thus, this one word appears to make the Genesis cap tenable, but there are a few problems. Even though we use replenish today almost exclusively to refill something or, to, or do something again, that is not the primary definition and was not its definition at all in 1611. The word was not understood that way, to refill something. Here is what the current 2019 Marion Western Dictionary has to say. Replenish, a verb. 1. 1A. To fill with persons or animals. Stock. 1B. Archaic. To supply fully. 1C, 
to fill with inspiration or power. 2A, to fill or build up again. 2B, to make good. Notice how definition 1B, to supply fully. This is precisely what it means in Genesis 1.28 and in Genesis 9.1. You don't have to go to it, but I'll read Genesis 9.1 quickly to you. This is when Noah was given the command after he came out of the ark. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And most people think, oh yes, that's the command to refill it again. But is, it, does that mean that? <clears throat> Notice how definition 1b, to supply fully. This is precisely what it means in Genesis 1.28 and Genesis 9.1 in the King James Bible. It does not mean to refill, but to fill fully completely or abundantly. Webster's 1828 dictionary is essentially the same. To fill, to stock with numbers or abundance. Replenish is a form of the word replete, which means fully or abundantly provided or filled. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, replenish was not used in the sense of refill until 1632, 21 years after the authorized version was published. One source says it was used in a poetic sense as a refill in 1612, but Genesis 128 is not poetry. As for the word's origin, when we, uh, this resource states, Late Middle English, in the sense, supply abundantly. From Old French, replenis, R-E-P-L-E-N-I-S-S. -S. Lengthened stem of replenir, R-E-P-L-E-N-I-R. -E -E From R-E-A-G-A-I-N, re again, all expressing intensive force plus plenir, fill, from Latin plenus, full. Notice how it originally meant to supply abundantly, and the re, the re, prefix can express intensive force instead of again. Furthermore, every time Every other time replenish is used in the King James Bible, it's, it, it is always means to fill thoroughly or abundantly and not necessarily refill. Like I said, you can find an example of that in Genesis chapter 9 verse 1. Also in Isaiah chapter 2 verse 6. You go to this, these uh, <coughs> sources later in your own studies. You also find it again in Isaiah 23, the 23rd chapter, verse 2, and also in Jeremiah 31, verse 25. And there's others too. Furthermore, every time we plunge is used in the King James Bible, it always means to fill thoroughly or abundantly and not necessarily refill. That at an instance such as Genesis 9-1 may also happen to be, ref to be a refill is irrelevant. Filling something does not mean it could not have been filled before. It just means it does not require that it has been, that it, that it has been filled before. <clears throat> Witness of the earlier English Bibles. As any student of the history of the English Bible should know, the King James Bible was based upon the earlier English Bibles. Here is how several of the earlier Bibles rendered Genesis 128. 
Wycliffe, 1388, and fill ye the earth, not replenish, and fill ye the earth. Tyndale, 1530, and fill the earth. Coverdale, 1535, and fill the earth and subdue it. Matthews, 1537, and fill the earth. Geneva Bible, 1560, and fill the earth. However, the King James translators, as directed by King James himself, were to primarily follow the Bishop's Bible. And the Bishop's Bible was 1568 to 1602. And replenish the earth, Bishop's 1568 version. But the Bishop's Bible was mostly based upon the Great Bible of 1539 which was the first royally authorized English Bible. And the Great Bible says in 1539, and replenish the earth. So the usage of replenish is not original with the King James Bible, but can be directly traced to the Great Bible of 1539. The King James translators followed a directive and used the term replenished instead of fill. Moreover, it is clear to see the terms fill and replenish are used interchangeably. As soon as these facts are stated, some of the brethren will go into damage control and make all kinds of baseless claims. Some will say, quote, the King James Bible coined the usage of replenish as refill. It is an advanced revelation, end of quote. Hardly, as we mentioned, the modern usage didn't begin until 1632. It took many more years for it to be common use as such. Others, was others will still insist that replenish in Genesis 9-1, which happens to be also be a refilling, proves a refilling in Genesis 1-28. But this is flawed reasoning and wishful thinking. How many times have you filled your car with gasoline when it was also refilling? However, none of those times proves that any previous time it was filled, it was filled was a refill. Likewise, replenish in Genesis 9-1 does not in any way define the word in Genesis 1-28 that the earth had people on it before Noah is irrelevant. Some Baptist brethren will go into a RE, the re, prefix, tirade, claiming the RE always means to do something again. But this is not the case. According to the dictionaries, the prefix RE can be used in one of three ways. As one, again, or a new. Two, a complete pleative or intensification of the base, three, back or backward. To do again, reapply, remake, renew, and to go back, which means recede, return, regress, are common uses today. But the prefix RE used to do completely or thoroughly is also in frequent uses today and was even more common in 1611. I'll read that to you again. But the prefix RE, the RE, used to do completely or thoroughly is also in frequent uses today and was even more in common in 1611. Or to fully fill or to do completely was more common usage back then than, uh, than our understanding of refill is today. Actually, it was the original usage in replenish. Well, that's something most people don't know. I think it's important to know. Actually, it was the original usage in replenish. The RE, the RE prefix, intensified the base word. 
Yet today there are many words with the re prefix where it is not used as again or back, but as an intensifier. The Bible word reference reverence, excuse me, is one. It is formed from the old word, I'll spell it for you, V-E-R-E-R-I, which means to respect or to hold in awe, while the re intensifies the action. <clears throat> Thus, in both cases, re acts to intensify the root action with the only difference being the prefix in replenish has added the meaning again over the years while the prefix in reverence has not. Therefore, it is out of ignorance, Gaptis contend that in 1611, replenish meant to plenish again, plenish being an old word for fill, when the fact it is meant to plenish completely, write that down, to plenish completely or abundantly. In other words, to fill completely or to fill abundantly. Furthermore, with many re prefix words today, the original re meanings have been lost. As one source says, the precise sense of re is lost in secondary senses or weakened beyond recognition. There are 350 words in the King James Bible that begin with re, re, and many of them do not refer to anything being done again or going back. For an example, read, read, Require, remain, rebel, R E B E L, reward, rebuke, etc. The re argument of the gap proponents is an argument of desperation. Since the re prefix and replenish signifies to fill abundantly, does the text of the Bible bear this out? Sure it does. One key attribute of the King James Bible is how it can define its own terms using parallel statements. Consider the following parallels. In Genesis 1.21 Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters. Genesis 1.28 Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Genesis 9, 1, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Genesis 9, 7, be ye fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. So the key words there are fill, replenish, replenish, abundantly. Notice when the Lord restates his commission to Noah to replenish the earth, that he tells him to bring forth abundantly. There is not a hint of refilling in the command. The first verse of the parallel statement shows the key purpose for being fruitful is to fill. The last verse shows it to it, it the last verse shows it is to fill abundantly. These bookends explain the fine replenish in the two middle verses. You can also look see that kind of example in Genesis 120 and 121. For example, of how the Lord's command was being fulfilled by Noah's posterity con considered Exodus 1.7 and the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied. There again is the term abundantly associated with fruitfulness and increase. The pattern is clear. This definition of replenish as filled abundantly also fits perfectly with other places replenished is found. For example, Isaiah 23, verse 2. Be still, ye inhabitants of the isle, thou whom the merchants of Zidon that pass over the sea have replenished. 
Ezekiel 27, 25, The ship of Tarshish did sing of thee in thy market, and thou wast replenished, and made very glorious in the midst of the sea. The merchants of Zion filled the inhabitants of the isle, and the ship of Tarshish filled Tyrus abundantly until it was very glorious. This is not a hint of refilling in the passages. Okay, that's fine and dandy, but what about the Hebrew? We have been able to show that in 1611, replenish means fill abundantly without resorting to the Hebrew. So, if you trace the history of the word, In 1611, it still meant to fill abundantly. Except for maybe one incident where you found it in poetry, which meant to refill. But as this author said, we're not reading poetry when we're reading scripture here in these verses. <clears throat> and not to mention all the other previous Bibles, Coverdale, Tyndale, Outside of the Bishop's Bible, you always see replenished or to fill, to fill over and over. And then when you understand the full meaning of the word, to fill abundantly. Now let's look at the Hebrew. The Hebrew word male, which is translated as replenished, never means to refill. according to Brown, Driver and Briggs, and etc., other examples, it always means fill in this context, as in Genesis 1.22, as in Genesis 6.11, Genesis 42.25, 1, 1 Samuel 16.1, 1 Kings 18.33, Job 15.2, and others. Thus, since male cannot mean refill, the Gap opponents who insist it does are actually claiming the authorized version is not an accurate translation of the Hebrew. In their fervent quest to promote the Genesis Gap, they are in fact undermining the Bible. Furthermore, with the re, the re, in replenish, being an intensifier, the places where the King James translators use replenish instead of fill shows they deem those passages worthy of added emphasis. Replenish is not a synonym for, for simply fill. It is a synonym for fill completely, abundantly, or thoroughly. This is a distinction not found in the new translations that only use the term fill, and also a distinction unacknowledged by the gap theorists. As for the brethren who claim replenish is an advanced revelation, that was only recently revealed or, mis or understood. Are they, are they saying that for the first 200 years or so after the King James Bible was published, no one understood the truth of the term of believing it meant filled abundantly? I didn't bring it with me, but I have an 1828 Webster Dictionary. And it does mean to fill, to stock, to fully fill abundantly, even in 1828 Webster's Dictionary. Are they saying that for the first 200 years or so after the King James Bible was published, no one understood the truth of the term by believing it meant filled abundantly? Remember, in 1828, it was still primarily defined as fill. If so, please explain your reasoning in light of the next section. The gap proponents who rely... Gap promotes who rely, another re-word, by the way, on replenish as one of their main Genesis gap arguments, will often show their hypocrisy with other archaic English words that they have changed meaning over the years. Take prevent, for instance. Today it means to stop or hinder something from happening. In 1611, however, it meant to pre-event, P-R-E hyphen E-V-E-N-T, pre-event, precede, or come before something, not 
to stop or hinder something from happening. Look how using prevent in the modern sense can really mess up a passage, such as Psalm 88.13, which reads, But unto thee I have cried, O Lord, and in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. Is this prayer here stopping the Lord from doing something? Let me read the verse again. But unto thee I have cried, O Lord, and in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. This verse is saying the person's prayer will come before the Lord. It will prevent him. You can also look at 1 Thessalonians 4.15 for a more common example. It reads, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. In this passage, saying that those who are alive at the Lord's coming or rapture not going to stop those who are dead or asleep? Not at all. It is saying they will not precede or go ahead of them. Let me read that to you again. Is, this pass, is the passage saying that those who are alive at the Lord's coming or rapture not going to stop those who are dead or asleep? Not at all. It is saying that we will not proceed or go ahead of them. Another example of this is the word let in Romans 1.13 and letteth in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 8. Today, let, L-E-T, means to allow something to happen. But in the 1600s, it could mean exactly the opposite. That is, to hinder. If a modern King James Bible reader doesn't realize this, he will not understand the verses correctly. Most Gap opponents will be quick to explain the intended meaning with these archaic English word usage, except for replenish. Their duplicity is glaring. It is, clear consistency, it is clear consistency is not a concern with some of the brethren, especially when they have a pet doctrine they are supporting. Fascinating, isn't it? Some of the more knowledgeable gap theorists will refrain from using the word replenish argument since they understand it can backfire on them. However, however others cannot resist. Since, since it lends itself so well to gotcha moment against those who know the, don't know the truth meaning, which are most. Most people know the truth. Most people, when they see the word replenish used in the King James Bible, which the King James was not wrong using the word replenish. Let me make that very clear. Because the definition for it was totally different than what it's become and what we understand now today in 2022 and for the last probably 175 years. The word definitions have changed my friend. So when you read something and if you don't know what the definition was like and how it was used back in the day it was written, it's going to create problems. And of course then you have people with their own agendas and they want to push their certain doctrines because they cannot accept that this world was only created in well, it, this world was created 6,000 years ago there's no way why? because of science and I'm going to get into science later in the timeline teaching science supposedly proves differently no it doesn't they're just as bad as the religious folk. They made their science field a religion. And it's always constantly changing, by the way. They have to constantly in invent new dating methods to try to keep proving their nonsense. Because as their older dating methods are... <clears throat> actually, it's nothing new. They've been disproving the older dating methods for decades, decades. But as they disprove these dating methods as 
something that could be reliable, they have to come up with a new dating methods to try to offset the argument. They're convinced God created this world billions and billions of years ago. They're convinced man's been on this planet in one form or another for a very long time. They're convinced dinosaurs roamed this earth 150 plus million years ago. Not to mention other life forms before that. That go back at least to 230 million years ago. I showed a video not too long ago, about a week and a half ago, that laid some of the groundwork of why it's ridiculous. There's other videos, and I'm still debating whether I should play them or not, that go in a little bit more details, a little more scientific approach, as far as the language that's used, that competes with their own language that they use to disprove their nonsense. This world is not that old, my friend. And this universe is not that old. <clears throat> Even the gap there is contentious about contentions about replenish were true most would Even if the gap there is contentions were and about replenish were true, most would still have a problem. When one refills or replenishes something in the current sense, it is expected that the object be refilled with the same type of contents. If one is refilling an empty glass of water, it is expected, if not required, that it be refilled with the same substance, water. Filling with bleach or motor oil is not replenishing unless it's specifically stated that it should be replenished with something different. The problem here with some of the Gap brethren is they claim only the morning stars and sons of God were with Lucifer on the pre-Adam earth. <clears throat> they insist there were no men there. However, when God told Adam and Eve to replenish the earth, they could only populate it with mankind like themselves. It would not be populated with the same type of creatures as before. Again, replenish only means to fill abundantly. Understanding this solves all the problems. The mess is some of the brethren get themselves into. Yes, they do. <clears throat> Let's replenish the earth. Replenish with what? Did Adam-like beings existed before the earth became void once again? When the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, before God moved upon the face of the waters, He obviously wiped everything out, according to Gap Theory people. So what existed? Some will say dinosaurs. Some will say angels. Some would say some kind of man, because we dig up strange-looking animals that look like man, or somewhat look like man, there's, um, I think I am going to play a video that shows you why some of these crowed magnum type supposedly our ancestors don't even come close of what an atom being that God created is like. We're going to replenish the earth. They're not going to replenish what existed prior to it, if you believe the gap theorists. Whatever man was like back then, why not start all over again? And replenish with the same thing again. To refill it again with the same type of pe people, if that's what they were. But that's not what happened. And that could be, provably, that could be, that could be proved fairly easily that what we are is nothing like what existed if the gap theory people were accurate with their information. Doesn't even come close, my friend. What 
Adam was instructed by God to do was to fill the earth and fill it abundantly. What Noah's instruction to him and his family was is to fill the earth and fill it abundantly. Not to refill it whatever existed before. No. Noah had to start all over again. And the same command that was given to Adam is to fill it and make sure you fill it abundantly. That's what it meant in 1611. Outside of the Bishop's Bible, which that has a whole slew of other problems, that's what it meant to all the other translators all the way from the 1300s on up. In fact, you can even go further back than that in some of the ancient documents. The thing is, my friend, it never meant, or it was never to be defined as to refill. It should be to fill and to fill abundantly. Now, I just read you one source. There's many sources on the subject matter. And they pretty much all come to the same conclusion. The gap theorists are using a modern de definition for a word that completely meant something different than how it's used today. I mean, you don't have to dig that deep as a biblical detective to find that kind of information out. But who's looking? Who's looking? Think about it. You hear this preach in the pulpits? Maybe at a convention once in a while that deals with creation, especially young creation conventions. But that's about it. it most people don't know. So they're assuming, in fact, unfortunately, they're falling into the trap, the evolutionist trap. that leads you down another rabbit hole that I believe breaks faith. Because why does it break faith? Because when you dig into the Bible, an old earth and a young earth don't add up. Either one's right or one's wrong, or one, or if the, if the, if the old earth is right, then the young earth is wrong. If the young earth is right, then the old. <clears throat> creation or earth is wrong. Now there's other ways we're going to look at it, including God's timeline and why the creation process is important to understand in God's timeline. Because in each day of creation, it tells us something. Not just what happened 6,000 years ago, but what happens in every year that passes by in that 6,000 years. Now that might sound a little confusing now, but I'll make it more clear in the next few service programs. The creation story in Genesis, early chapters, gives us the end from the beginning. And then once it's established that as a timeline, we are going to go through books of the Bible to prove that time that timeline is accurate. It's something we've never done up to this point in the last day series. Now we've used other timelines to set markers of certain events that happened and will happen <clears throat> to prove God's word that he is faithful in keeping his promises. And what he said would happen, did happen. For an example, 1948, that important date, which is a very important date even in the creation timeline. But we'll use all the scriptures. In fact, we'll use the patriarchs. We'll use it all to prove that God's been saying the same thing.
throughout all the scriptures. And that's why this is not by accident. This is our true source. For not only knowing what's ahead of us, but also what's already taken place. And how God has set it up, I believe, to build faith. And I believe this will be another component that adds to your knowledge of His Word that will even more cement your faith. This, and you will see how marvelous God is and how in the world He's able to put this all together in so many different ways that tells the same story and keeps the timeline perfectly. We have quite a journey ahead of us. And if you want to make that journey, I encourage you to stick around. But I don't want to go any further until we straighten out this word replenish. Write in your Bibles. It means to fill and to fill abundantly, not to refill with something that was previously, but somehow got wiped out, now you have to do it all over again. That's a modern day definition that the gap theorists have used and taken advantage of. And many of them, by the way, have changed your mind about that theory. But there's still some hanger-ons that refuse to accept the knowledge of the truth of what this verse is saying. Well, hopefully you do. And now, if you didn't know, you, do, you know now. So if anybody ever asks you, well, he, they're just replenishing, because that's what they're instructed to do, with a modern de definition. It says, no, let me make the correction for you. This didn't start, this modern definition, until after 1828, really, to be put in use in a grander scale. But in King James days, even in King James days, outside the Bishop Bible, it mostly was understood as to fill and the intensifier to fill it abundantly. Make it happen. You got it? If you do, I want to hear from you. Play a song. <laughs>